doubt in that question. Question number one, any doubt in this question? Anyone having a doubt in any part? If you don't have any doubt, just mention no, so I will move on. Relative charge means comparison. Like example, a proton, you have to learn the relative mass. When you compare the mass of proton and neutron, they are identical masses. So ratio is one is to one. That's why the relative mass or comparative mass is one. Relative charge for proton is plus, for electron is minus and neutron nil or zero, nil or zero having a same meaning. You have to learn this, this table we already discussed in the first chapter, the relative mass and relative charge of the elements uh, of the proton, electron and neutron. Any other question, any doubt in question one? Question two, any doubt? Two A was not there because it is related. It's from two B, two B and onwards. Two B two and okay. So in part B, magnesium reacts slowly with the warm water to form a base. Magnesium hydroxide. What is meant by the term base? So basically, first you have to write the definition of a base. A definition of acid, acid are proton donors. And what is the definition of a base? It is proton acceptor. A substance which accept proton, we call that as a base. Then write a chemical equation for the reaction between magnesium and warm water. So they already mentioned magnesium reacts slowly with a warm water to form magnesium hydroxide. So a magnesium metal reacted with a warm water and it will form magnesium hydroxide. And what else will be there? Magnesium hydroxide plus hydrogen gas will be there. Then we have to balance this equation. So we have, we start balancing with oxygen followed by hydrogen and then other elements. So we have two hydrogen on the left hand side and four hydrogen on the right hand side. So if I, or we have two oxygen on the right hand side, only one oxygen. So if I put two, oxygen is balanced, hydrogen is also balanced and magnesium is already balanced. This was 2B2. Then during the reaction, this is 2F2. Yeah. During the reaction, the amount of energy given out is 300, uh, 780 kilojoule per mole. I mean, this is the amount of energy which is released. So energy really, and when in terms of bond breaking and bond forming, the formula is bond breaking minus bond forming is equals to energy change. Because this reaction is exothermic, so if it's an exothermic reaction, we'll not write only 780, we'll write minus 780 because it's an exothermic reaction. As I mentioned, it is given out. Now bond breaking energy, the reactant side is a bond breaking energy and the product side is a bond forming energy. So in the reactant side, their sulfur atom is there, so there is no bond here. But fluorine and fluorine, one single bond between within the molecule of fluorine, and there's another single bond in the second molecule of fluorine. Each is equals to 160. So bond breaking will be 2 multiplied by 160. Why 2 multiplied by 160? Because two fluorine bonds, single bonds will break. But for sulfur, because it's an atom, that's why it does not have any bond breaking energy. 
Then bond forming, how many bonds are formed? One, two, three, four. So four SF bonds are formed. So in a bracket, we will write S, F. You can write X also, you can write SF. Two multiply by 160, that is equals to 320 minus four SF bonds is equals to minus 780. We need SF, so 320 is positive, other side it will be negative. So minus 4S, 7, uh, 4 SF is equals to minus 780 and minus, because it is plus here, so other side will be minus 320. So when you add this uh, minus 780 plus 320, that's equal to 1100, but negative. And this is also minus 4SF, but in the question, we need SF bond energy, energy for one SF bond. So four is minus four is multiplied, other side it will divide. So SF bond energy is minus 1100 divided by minus four. So when we solve this 1100 divided by four, that is equals to 275 kilojoule per mole. Is it clear? The bond breaking minus bond forming is equals to energy change. Two E calcium phosphate is used in fertilizers. The bonding in calcium phosphate is ionic. Calcium and phosphate contain a phosphate ion. What is ionic bonding? So definition of ionic bonding, the bond which is formed or the electrostatic attraction between the two unlike charges. Because in ionic bond, we have a positive and negative charges. So and whenever charges are there, we call that as electrostatic and attraction between positive and negative charges. When positive and negative charges are attract each other, we call that bond as ionic. Deduce the formula of calcium phosphate. How you can deduce the formula? So calcium is group two, so it's two plus or plus two. And phosphate is three minus. So whenever two valencies are not same, you will cross multiply after simplifying them. You cannot simplify two and three, so just cross multiply. So it will be Ca, calcium will be three. And phosphate is PO4, then in a bracket, two. That's a formula for calcium phosphate. Part 2F is related to bonding and uh, structure. Uh, it's uh, energy from chemicals. Energy change during a chemical reaction or energy from chemicals. Then moving on to question three, any doubt in question three? Is there any doubt, question three? Three A and three B one. Look, what is happening in this experiment when sodium thiosulfate Na2S2 O3 reacting with HCl, it will form sulfur, sodium chloride, water. Sulfur is solid. So when the solids start to form, what will happen? The cross will disappear. You will not be able to see through it. So this cross will disappear. So you're recording a time taken by this cross to disappear. If this cross will disappear in a short time, it means the rate or the reaction is faster. If the cross will take more time, it means the reaction is slower. So time and rate are inversely proportional to each other. So in the first part, look, you have the reactant sodium thiosulfate and HCl. Why you are adding a water? Because you are carrying out the experiment. So you want to keep the total volume same. So when you keep the total volume same, 
the substance which is having a greater amount or greater volume in the mixture that will have a higher concentration as well so what volume of thiosulfate was 10 volume of hydrochloric acid is 10 volume of distilled water is 40 so what is the total volume of the solution that's 60 so 20 plus 10 plus 30 so total volume is 60 now in the first part state the order in which the sodium thiosulfate hydrochloric acid and distilled water is used distilled water is not the reactant just you are make, adding a distilled water so that you make the solution of different concentrations so thiosulfate sodium thiosulfate and hcl are the reactants but still you are adding a water what is the reason why you are adding a water so that you can make different concentration of the solutions and what should be the order like i should not add hydrochloric acid and thiosulfate together why because then the addition of the water will not make difference to the concentration so first i can add thiosulfate then i can add water and then so hydrochloric acid or first i can add water then i can add thiosulfate and then i can add hydrochloric acid or first i can add hydrochloric acid then distilled water and then thiosulfate but the combination which is not acceptable is adding hydrochloric acid and thiosulfate together because addition of the water in that case will not make any difference is it clear two part a why we are add, not adding the water water can be add you can add water in the beginning you can add water in the middle but not at the last then 3b in which experiment in in experiment 3 the student want the thiosulfate to be a double concentration used in experiment 2 like we want more thiosulfate so how i can have more thiosulfate or double thiosulfate so in experiment 2 i use 20 cm cube of thiosulfate how I, what is a double of 20 so if i want to make it double then it should be 40 like more cm thiosulfate hydro amount of hydrochloric acid was same throughout because we are changing the amount of thiosulfate and making a different concentration of a solution and identifying the rate. What should be the volume of the water added? What should be the volume of the water added? So it will be 10 because the total volume of the solution is 60. In all the experiment, experiment one, the total was 60, experiment two, the total is 60. And experiment three, the total is also 60. Then what is the relation between rate and time or rate and concentration? Rate and concentration are directly proportional and rate and time are inversely proportional. So what I did, I double the concentration. If I double the concentration, the rate will be double. The speed of the reaction will be twice. If speed of reaction is twice, if react, so if speed of reaction is multiplied by 2, then the time should be divided by 2. So if speed of reaction multiplied by 2, time should be divided by 2. So originally it was 28. Now how, how, how this should be divided by 2. So 28 divided by 2, that's equal to 14. So if we take a greater amount of solution, greater concentration of the solution, then the rate of the reaction will be half. Like if I double the concentration, rate will be half. If I, uh, sorry, the time will be half, not rate. If I double the concentration, the rate will be double, but the time will be half. If I triple the concentration, rate will be triple, but the time will be divided by three. Is it clear how we complete this table for the volumes of thiosulfate, hydrochloric acid, and distilled water? Then question number four, any doubt in question four? This is related to electrolysis. Is there any doubt in question four?
So basically what is happening in this electrolysis? Electroplating of a steel object, we can coat with copper, we can coat with nickel, and then we can coat uh, silver. First one, we are coating with copper. So if you are coating with copper, a solution contain a copper ion and electro anode also made up of copper. Copper ions will move towards cathode. So copper ion will move towards cathode. They will take two electrons and change to copper atom. When substance gain electron, we call reduction. And what happened as the amount of copper ion in the solution decreases, this is active electrolysis, active electrodes in which the electrode, the copper atom from anode will go inside the solution and turn into copper ion. So whether this process is oxidation or reduction, the first one, because it's a gain of electron and you will remember from oil rig, O stands for oxidation, I stands for is, and L stands for loss. R stands for reduction, I stands for is, and G stands for gain. So that is reduction because it's a gain of electron. In the second part, they're saying, why the concentration of a copper ion in electrolyte remain constant throughout in step one? Why the amount of copper ion does not change? So basically what is happening when the copper ion discharge or collected at cathode, one of the copper atom will go inside the solution as a, cop as a copper ion. That is why the amount of copper ion in the solution will not change or the copper ions which are leaving the solution is same as the copper ion entering the solution from anode. That is why the, the color does not change or the concentration does not change as well. This was question four. Question number five, any doubt in this question? Question five. Is there any doubt in question five? Why is aqueous metal sulfate used in solution? In question four, here we need a soluble salt. So when we need a soluble salt, we can even use copper, more, all nitrates are soluble. So I can take aqueous copper nitrate. So any salt which is soluble can be used here. Basically we need a soluble salt. Because copper sulfate is soluble, that's why we are using copper sulfate. It can be copper nitrate as well. The idea is that for electrolysis, we should have aqueous or salt solution so that ions can discharge easily. So this was question five, the 